and uh, thank you to the AWRI for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Uh, what I'm intending to do today, and I hope this fits in with what the AWRI wants, but I'm looking at this from a very practical perspective and sharing some uh, of my my experience in it and also some local research in, um, in trying to deal with some of the issues about particle filled technology. So as part of a background, I am from the Riverland region and um, heat waves are just characteristic of trying to grow grapes in our region. Um, and in the past, many growers had uh, full cover irrigation such as sprinklers or uh, low levels or flood irrigation back in the old days. And heat damage uh, wasn't so much an issue as it can be with drip irrigation. Now with um, basically all of our vineyards pretty well under drip irrigation, trying to search out for much more efficient irrigation methods. It means that we don't have so much of a root zone to draw on when uh, heat spikes happen. It also means uh, that we don't have wonderful cover crops down the middle of the, the rows as we used to in the old days. And you can see, hopefully in the background of the slide, you can make out uh, the two vineyards on the right that are irrigated with full cover sprinklers and compare that to the very dry looking vineyards on the, the, the left side of the slide. And so what that means is that um, when we do get heat spikes, as we have got for years, uh, it, it can cause a lot more damage than it perhaps was when we had uh, older irrigation techniques. So why use sunscreens? Well, there are many different reasons um, to do that, including it's not just about crop loss, but um, we've noticed certainly when vines get heat stress, they stop ripening. Um, it also has deleterious effects on some of the um, beneficial compounds that make good wine. Um, it also, there are also claims as far as water use efficiency goes. Um, I just be very careful with that depending on what your, your motive is for using sunscreens, but certainly that can happen. Um, and there were various types of these products around. Um, the more common ones, I guess, were kaolin based. Uh, we did have calcium carbonate, but I believe that's no longer available. And there's a new one called Photon, which is uh, a blend of dicarboxylic acids. Well, heat, da heat damage can be just um, pretty disastrous in terms of both yield and quality loss and some varieties are more susceptible than others. Um, we've often found that uh, the musket varieties such as musket gordo blanco, um, musket frontenien uh, and also um, red varieties where there are red dark exposed berries sitting out in the open sun, they can really get burnt really badly. Uh, it seems to be a combination of not only temperature but time as well. So um, hot temperatures, yes, long time at warm temperatures, yes, that'll cause damage. And uh, often just trying to add water to combat that is not enough to prevent damage. Um, and that's some of the um, shots we've had of, of damage in our region in the past. You could see some of the canopies uh, are also damaged. It's not just berries that get uh, dried up. There's also a, a whole of vine stress effect. So back when I used to have a real job uh, and I was working at a vineyard full time, um, we started playing around with PFT products because we had uh, issues in particular with Merlot and uh, there was a lot of damage um, in the Merlot we had planted on north-south roads. Now in the rural land we tend to get uh, predominantly westerly winds and in these rows of north-south orientation the Merlot canopy would roll, it would expose a lot of the berries and they would end up getting burnt. It was also, you'd get a lot of off flavours developing, so there was a quality problem. Um, we noticed that once we started using some of the, the kale and based products that we got uh, really good feedback from the GLOs who were looking at that, uh, at the, assessing that fruit in the field, and uh, they said that they could taste the difference. Um, Initially, once some of these products were getting more popular, some wineries actually started to get a bit resistant to them. They were not confident, I guess, uh, that there were not going to be other uh, related issues from spraying this stuff on your vine. Uh, and a lot of that was based around, I guess, the knowledge that some of these were based on a clay. Uh, many thought that clay is a fining agent, so it would have bad effects on colour and so on. Um, thankfully now, I guess, there's a lot more confidence in them. 
you can see in the slide there at the bottom right, there's an infrared thermometer focusing on an exposed bunch, and that's uh, 50 degrees centigrade. So it can get pretty warm. So often people ask, do they work? Well, it's a very interesting question. We're now in my current job as viticulturist at CCW Co-op, we are seeing growers use them, and it's wholly and solely about trying to avoid crop loss nowadays, in particular with uh, things like white frognac and um, gordo. Uh, the results, however, are not always perfect, um, and uh, there's, there's a real difference in whether they actually work and prevent damage or, or not. Um, that may be related to the application success, but I think also it has something to do with the extremity of the conditions you're dealing with. Um, for example, if you're really facing a massive heat spike and the, the ambient temperature is up around 47 degrees, you're probably in a situation where very little would save your vibes anyway, but I'll go into that later. The Riverland Viticulture Technical Group um, conducted uh, two successive field trials, I guess you would call them, uh, uh, using some of these products in the field, and there were mixed results, as I've mentioned, just similar to what growers find in the field. We have had, uh, I guess, one of the trials was compromised in the first year, where throughout the region there was really widespread sulphur burn, and one of the patches where one of the products was being tested, unfortunately, suffered really horrendous sulphur burn. Uh, there was, uh, I think, it was a day of about 47 degrees. The grower had sprayed, I think, the day before at night with sulphur, but it uh, it just burnt the whole crop. So that uh, that was inconclusive. But but there were some results that came out of that um, where different um, different strategies, I guess, were employed in trying to reduce crop loss. So a real quick um, thumbnail sketch of some of the findings were, we found that the PFT sometimes had the ability to reduce crop loss from heat events. Uh, also, it maintained colour. Um, for example, uh, in the treated um, Shiraz that we tried, it had 27% uh, less crop loss than in the control. Uh, yet the colour was about the same and the bome was about the same uh, when it was harvested on the same night. We found uh, from testing temperatures it could moderately reduce the temperature of bunches and leaves uh, through the, the treatment of it. And what I'm referring to here is the trials that were done with the Kaywood based product. Now um, you're looking at probably uh, five to six percent difference in um, in uh, leaf temperatures and uh, two to three percent difference in uh, berry temperatures, but uh, that may not seem statistically significant, um, but uh, as I'll show in a minute, I think it probably does have an effect. Um, and why, the question is, why is it only sometimes seem to be effective? So what I'm going to share with you is an out and out practical uh, experience. Uh, there is massive disclaimer on this. I'm not someone who wears a lab coat. I'm not a scientist. I've got mud on my boots. So this is what we've seen as a result of experience in the field. It seems very clear that vines all suffer heat stress in different ways. Uh, it seems that Merlot has a different reaction uh, than does Shiraz uh, and then does Cabernet. And this is a function of um, variety, clone, rootstock, uh, soil type, irrigation system and so on. It's also to do with the temperature and the duration ex of exposure during the heat stress. All vines seem to have a temperature for a particular patch and so on where they shut down. Uh, as a drought response. So during that, those heat spikes, the vines uh, react to try and uh, restrict water loss, uh, and in doing so, in stopping transpiration, uh, they cease cooling. So the natural plant reaction, if you like, is probably making uh, the, the leaves prevent their cooling and then start to cook in the sun. So again, this comes with a massive list of disclaimers, but this is what the theory about how it might work. We see a difference in temperature here of only two or three degrees between the treated and, and the control. Yet that's not significant over the whole temperature, but if you're looking at it compared to a shutdown temperature, and on this slide I've drawn that at a green line at about 41 degrees Celsius, if that de decrease in temperature reduces it below the temperature at which they shut down, then transpiration function can still continue. And so your vine can continue to use water and can continue to cool. Um, that also has other impact on the canopy microclimate. 
So although the temperature difference may not be significant, um, hopefully, uh, but it seems that there is a significant result from it. And when we get to hotter conditions, um, I mentioned that uh, the temperature of the damage is a function of temperature and time. So if we look at the area between that red curve of the control treatment without P PFT and the green line, it's safe to say the comparison between the treated and control would be the area beneath that red curve and the green line and the area beneath the, green, uh, the blue line and that green line. So although it's only a couple of degrees difference, uh, you're still getting vines shutting down with the spray with sunscreens, but maybe that's just allowing, it's just reducing the damage. Now, reasons they don't always work, I guess. Uh, I've seen some where, uh, some incidences where growers have had a lot of trouble trying to get good application of these products, the carbon product in particular, uh, whereby there are problems with it trying to get it to stick on berries. So if you, your coverage isn't brilliant, you're only getting a one or two degree difference at most, and then the difference between the treatment and a control probably isn't enough. And then you could probably say here, if you're getting really extreme heat, um, you're probably getting an area here beneath that blue curve and the green line, whereby it's still going to suffer a fair amount of damage. And so that, uh, even though that's probably sprayed with a sunscreen product, uh, people would look at this result and say, oh, the sunscreen maybe didn't work because I've still suffered damage, but the damage may be a lot less than you would have otherwise seen. So this may go some way to explaining why there is a difference in results that we see from using these products. And you can see here, um, it's all about coverage. Uh, I've got some pictures here of pretty poor coverage on gordo berries in particular. They seem very hard to coat because they're waxy. Uh, and the practical applications of, of, uh, of trying to get it to work uh, are real concern. So what we've found tends to work really well is um, spraying up to the point of runoff. Um, if you're putting on way too much volume and trying to really uh, flood this material on, it can end up slumping. So it ends up dropping around the end of a berry. It ends up uh, falling down to the margin of a leaf and not giving a nice even coverage. And it, to that end, it seems that um, several light applications work a lot better than trying to get one heavy one to work. Um, medium and fine jets uh, and at a suitable ground speed, uh, that seems to work really well. Agitation with the kaolin product is absolutely critical. We had one grower who started uh, spraying with this trial and for some reason known only to himself. He turned the, the patio off at the end of the row when he was turning around and uh, the filter had blocked by the time he went back in the row. So you need really good agitation. They have to really be applied before the heat wave continues, uh, before the heat wave comes, uh, not during or after. If you've already suffered damage, then you're not going to get the benefit out of using these products. And I go back to the, the claim about water reduction. Uh, I would suggest not using these as a substitute for, um, for water in really extreme conditions. Uh, for preventing crop loss, um, it's best used in conjunction with a, a really good water regime. They may have uh, an application in reducing water use under moderate stress. When you're facing really severe heat spikes, I think um, it's the old saying about why bring a knife to a gunfight. And as I mentioned about um, at Jubilee Park, we did get good results of spraying on one side of the row. So these were applied uh, just on the westerly side of North South Rows. So um, spraying, I guess, from about 5 o'clock to 2 o'clock, if you're looking from south to north, and that combated the afternoon sun. Um, finally, I'd say avoid combining these uh, with sulphur. They really are best used on their own. I mentioned earlier there was a trial where these products were combined with sulphur and there was sulphur burn, but I'm not convinced that was a problem with the products themselves. Uh, they may have, those vines may have got sulphur burn anyway, but really when you look at what you're trying to achieve, you, with these products you're trying to spray the outside of the canopy. 
Um, the spray application really is trying to change the albedo of the leaves and the berries that are exposed to sun. So there's not a lot to be gained, in particular with the kaolin based products, of trying to get coverage that you would be looking for uh, with the fungicide spray. Therefore, uh, you're probably, compared to a fungicide spray, less air may be needed. And um, some growers have actually run their fans at either low speed or just had the fans turned off. They've run them at slightly faster ground speed, and as I say, they're within reason. And it may have a different jet type and combination um, to what you'd normally use in fungicide sprays. So therefore, it's probably not practical to think of uh, combining these with other fungicides anyway. When uh, these were used at Jubilee Park, uh, we actually just used a, a boom spray, um, which you'll never really think of relying on as far as a fungicide spray was, was concerned. Now, pretty well all of these issues are, are relating to the kaolin-based products. Uh, I don't have personal experience in applying um, the dicarboxylic acid products, the photon, but from what uh, the growers tell me, it's basically, um, you're looking at rates of, I think it's around 20 grams per hectare as a maximum rate, so uh, it's probably like a dessert spoon full of um, bicarb soda mixed up in a thousand litres of water, it's basically just like spraying water. There's, there are no issues at all from a practical point of view, it's, uh, it's not problematic at all from what I've heard. So, as I mentioned, really you need to be spraying with good application, uh, good agitation to try and make sure you're not getting blockages and so on. Uh, at least three even equal coats are better than trying to get one heavy coat uh, in order to get it to stick. Uh, think of it as a spray painting job and just building up the coverage on it. And uh, what um, I, I think some of the um, the regime that uh, they were trying, some growers have been trying, instead of having one really heavy application at say five kilos uh, per thousand litres, sorry per hundred litres to start with, they dropped that down to about three applications to three um, and that seemed to work reasonably well. Um, and if you really want to get a good job, um, some have tried applying the first coat with two light applications uh, from the spray cart travelling in opposite directions, just making sure they're covering all, all the gaps in the canopy that they can. Uh, once the first coat sticks, um, subsequent applications of uh, the, the uh, kaolin sticks a lot better. And uh, some growers have tried with different wetting agents that sort of aid the spread and adherence. Um, I have heard of one grower trying uh, organosilica wetters, some have tried the normal 1000 wetters. Uh, it's basically a matter of trial and terror. Uh, it really comes back with wetting agents, the better they are the more careful you probably have to be about your application rate because if they wet really well you can encourage too much slumping. Also, as a final note there in bold and red, um, make sure that your GLO or your winery knows that you're going to do this. Uh, get their permission before you do it. Uh, it's a bit hard to hide a, a vineyard that's all turned white when they're not expecting it and um, they may not react very well to that uh, if they're not expecting it. So in summary, uh, I'd say sunscreen products can, certainly, they can help to reduce damage. Um, they're not a bulletproof solution and there are some reasons why we, from what we've seen, you get to different uh, effectiveness in the, in the results of applying them. Um, there is a chance that you may get an extreme heat spike uh, that may be so severe uh, that nothing can prevent the damage. But then again, uh, if you don't try, then you'll probably guarantee that you'll, you'll get damage and crop loss. So this is all about a matter of assessing risk and trying to reduce risk. It's a matter of probabilities. Uh, so if you're doing this and managing the risk, then hopefully uh, you're much less likely to suffer crop loss. As I mentioned before, I, I consider these products used in addition to rather than instead of, uh, of irrigation if you're looking at uh, dealing with extremes of heat. Um, and finally, if it's worth doing, um, do it well. Uh, the best success has been where growers have played around with their particular spray plant and their particular canopy and, and managed to uh, table that to get the best coverage they can and they get a nice even white coverage on it and uh, then they've had pretty good results. So that's the end of my presentation part. There's uh, 
anyone have any questions?